411 Live. Where you can learn about issues that affect us every day. State of world. 411 Live. Real people, real talk. Made to help people in our community in every way. For your girl. 411 Live. I'm not just an athlete. I am more than just a choice student. I'm not a class clown. I am more than a high school dropout. I'm more than just a public school transfer. I deserve to be here. I deserve to be heard. What would it take for you to hear us? Does it have to be one of your students murdered by police brutality? Hi, my name is Janae and I've experienced racism at Milwaukee Luther in high school. My name is Brandon Hopkins and I've experienced racism at Milwaukee Luther. My name is Karan and I've experienced racism at Milwaukee Luther. My name is Grady and I definitely experienced racism at Milwaukee Luther. My name is Monty, and I've experienced racism at Milwaukee Lutheran. My name is Jessica, and I've experienced racism at Milwaukee Lutheran. My name is Caleb, and I've experienced racism at Milwaukee Lutheran High School. My name is Michaela, and I've experienced racism at Milwaukee Lutheran. My name is Cheyenne, and I've experienced racism at Milwaukee Lutheran. My name is Terrence, and I've experienced racism at Milwaukee Lutheran. My name is Carl, and I've experienced racism at Milwaukee Lutheran. My name is Lydia Brown, and I've experienced racism at Milwaukee Lutheran. My name is Thomas Leonard, and I experienced racism at Milwaukee Lutheran. My name is Jordan Hopkins, and I've experienced racism at Milwaukee Lutheran High School. How do you build bridges when you feel the pieces are broken? Hello, everyone. I'm Beverly Taylor, and this is the 411 Live, real people, real talk. The piece you just heard was in response to a Facebook post by the Milwaukee Lutheran High School, and that happened back in August, and the post actually said, in part, Milwaukee Lutheran High School serves, educates, and invests in over 800 Black students and their families each year. We do not endorse the beliefs of the organization called Black Lives Matter as the founding principles of their beliefs, as outlined in the About Us section of their website, do not align with biblical views. And that section deals with um, the LBGTQ. And then, of course, throughout, it talks about how we have supported Black lives and Black families for many years, uh, deeply invested in the spiritual life and in financial support in excess of $2.4 million annually of the Black community. Uh, we love and serve our Black families and Black lives boldly, and will continue to do that. They draw a distinction between the Black Lives Matter movement and the Black Lives Matter organization. Well, Joining me now, I have three young men who are former students of Milwaukee Lutheran. Carl Greer. Wave for me, Carl. There you go. Karan Sims and Monty Berry. I have to ask you guys, what was your reaction? We see it from the video, but what, tell me your reaction when you read the statement. To be honest, I wasn't surprised, but I'm like, whoa, they bold with it now. <laughs> they just gonna put it on the Facebook page. Like, that's like them standing behind that statement. So that initially, I think that initially shocked me because I'm like, who did they go through to like, like talk about this before they posted it? It just seemed like they just, just posted it and didn't like get any like feedback from it. So that part surprised me. But like overall, from my experiences, like looking back, that it really didn't surprise me. Ultimately. Yeah. What jumped out? Just the lack of support, especially when they, like, what you just read, when they say they boldly stand behind Black students, it's like, where at? We don't see that. We don't feel that. Um, and I know that's, that's just a tough thing. Um, just to see your former high school, like, school that you want to have pride in, just, like, just put out a statement like that. What year did you attend there? I graduated from, uh, I graduated in 2015. Okay. So I was there from 2011 to 2015. All right. Um, let's, Carl, what was your reaction? Um, seeing that 
Tef don't, that tone deaf statement was really disappointing. But as Karan said earlier, it wasn't really surprising. It really aligned with my own personal experiences at Milwaukee Lutheran and just not having a space where I felt affirmed as a Black individual in America. So to read some of the things that they touched on in the statement, it really came off as me being tokenized as a Black student at Milwaukee Lutheran and that I really wasn't valued that my black brothers and sisters really weren't valued navigating that space. And it was just to use us as some type of money ploy to show that a good service is being done. But yeah, like Karan said earlier, it was disappointing, but not surprising. Okay. And Monty? Yeah, to piggyback right off of what they said, you know, we all went there for four years and we Again, we're not surprised. Um, having spent, you know, so much time in high school there within the building around the teachers, and it, it really, honestly, did you know fit right in with what they're about. I guess the more shocking part was, like Ron said, as they went public with it. You know, we we I think we were all appalled. Like, oh, okay, this is new. You know, I I, I remember vividly waiting as every school, every business, every person made a statement about the George Floyd situation. I watched and I was like, I wonder what Milwaukee Lutheran is going to say about this. And nothing came, nothing came, nothing came. So I kind of figured that was the approach they were going to take. And so after a few different events transpired within the school that forced them to make a statement, I thought that was um, very shocking and interesting that they stood behind it and actually went public and did post the statement. So listening to you guys, um, you know, your shock and, and feeling that the statement wasn't, didn't, does not hold true. Tell me about your experiences at Milwaukee Lutheran. Um, I could go first on this one. Uh, I, I always tell people to this, um, as I've been kind of navigating through this whole situation with the statement and, just raising awareness on, you know, what's been happening within the school. Um, it always pains me because I did enjoy my time at Milwaukee Lutheran. It was not the worst years of my life by any stretch. You know, it's, it's high school. It is a fun place. But um, as I get older and I look and, you know, look back at it 2020 hindsight, I'm like, there's a lot of things that we, you know, had to endure and deal with that a normal high schooler really shouldn't. Um, one of the things that I, took no offense to at the time, but, you know, looking back at it, it kind of stands out to me uh, to go to the school. You have to test, you know, you have to test into the school. And I went to public school my whole life before that. And I remember being brought into a guidance counselor office and, you know, we're reviewing classes and schools and, you know, what I tested into. And the guidance counselor goes, you tested pretty good for a city boy. And, and at the time I'm like, oh, I'm smart for a city kid. You know, I'm 14. I'm mm -hmm. cool. But then you look back at it and you're like, why would you say that? <laughs> you know, and it's just little things like that that just goes over your head, you know, and it, and it stinks because in high school, it's not really a responsibility to solve racism or even recognize it. You know, you just kind of keep your head down and you focus on your sports and your school and you keep moving forward. So you still enjoy it. But, you know, it, it's a lot of things that and especially in the climate right now that looking back, I'm just like, that was wrong. And um, I think another thing I really experienced, too, being on two different ends of the spectrum, my freshman and sophomore year, um, like I said, coming from public school, I didn't really have like a clique or a friend group because everyone kind of comes from theater schools and they already know each other and things like that. And so it's really hard to kind of find a group and fit in. And it wasn't until I became a very good athlete and, you know, you start making all state teams and winning awards and stuff. And now all of a sudden, people love you. Everybody loves you. <laughs> but before that, you know, it's like, you know, so I, I didn't have to deal with a lot of stuff my junior, senior year that I dealt with my freshman, sophomore year. But, you know, not everybody reached that level of, of athlete or student, you know. And um, my sister is 16. She's in high school now. I remember talking to my parents about this situation when they asked, you know, what do you think about? send in my sister to Milwaukee mm -hmm. Lutheran and I thought about it and I said you know there's a 50 50 chance she's going to enjoy it if she's a really good athlete or a really good student she's going to have the time of her life but if she's just a you know an average kid there she's gonna deal with a lot of things that I don't think I want my sister dealing with 
And, and, um, and, and that pained me because it is a school I love, you know, and that's why we want it to bring attention because we, we're not trying to end the school. We don't want the school to close down. We simply want the school to do better. Okay. Did your sister go to Milwaukee Lutheran? Did she choose to? We ended up moving to Atlanta. Okay. okay. Well, that solved that problem. Huh? Okay. Right. All right. Um, Karan, Carl, tell me your experience. Um, so I came from NPS too, so that was a big culture shock. Um, I started like sports and like academics. I was in National Honor Society. Like I really struggled with my sense of belonging in the school because it's like you just look around and you just see like how they treat black students compared to like the white students and like how the white students treat us. It's like a culture thing. And like, I think that's bigger than the school. That's like the largest society and that's just playing itself in like a, a smaller like environment. Um, but at the time, you know, like Monty said, it's like you just going through school, going through the motions, trying to get your education. And then you look back on these things, and you're like, man, like we really put ourselves through that. We really went through that. Um, just one experience is I could think of. I was in Spanish class, and it's like a student of like one of the higher up administration administrators uh, within the school just said the N word just out of nowhere, and I'm just starting to learn Spanish. I'm like, what's going on? Like, and then it's just tough. And then you just look at the hallways, like. There was a lot of segregation, at least for my year, there was a lot of seg segregation, like black students on one side and white students on another side. And um, I know a book that I read that was, that kind of talked about that. It was like, uh, why are all the black students sitting together in the cafeteria? Um, and so it's just tough to look back on these things. It's even tough to talk about it because it's like, dang, we really went through all that. <laughs> and like, and when I seen the post being made, I seen people from class of 78, class of 80, like saying the same thing. So it's like, these things aren't new. They just keep repeating themselves, unfortunately. And I wish ML will take a big stance on those things, especially right. since the school demographic is large as black students. Okay. All right, Mr. Carl. Yeah, my experience echoes a lot of what um, Monty and Karan touched on earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a difference of, I did come from one of those feeder school schools, so shout out Mount Calvary Lutheran. Mm -hmm. And I was able to come into that space with a bunch of friends, but going through there, I definitely could tell there wasn't really a space for me to be my authentic black self. And typically when folks try to be themselves authentically black, it was met with repercussions. You would get, um, detention or you would get sent to the office, something of that nature, when really kids are just being kids. Nobody's doing anything that really would warrant that type of um, response. So and do you think it, like, it was a like a just it was a cultural difference? Yeah, coach a cultural difference. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, over time, when you're in that environment, you don't really think about things until you actually take time to reflect when you're outside those environments. And just in my time of reflection, looking back and seeing how it might have been me and one other non-white person in our AP courses, or I might have been the only person in my advanced math class, well, why is that? And you start to ask all these questions because there are a lot of capable students that simply aren't in spaces where they can succeed. And everybody in those spaces were doing the same type of activities, like go get tutoring, go talk to the teacher after class. And if you're doing those types of things, it makes it a lot easier to be in those types of spaces. So why aren't more non-white students given that opportunity to even be in that space? And so that was some of my experience at Milwaukee Lutheran, so. Okay. It sounds like you guys pinpoint different things that that showed up. It sounds like kind of a systemic thing. Um, but I also hear that it's not, you can't, you know, cover it with a broad stroke. You also had some good experiences there, but there are these other things that kind of clouded. Am I reading it right? Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So um, I want to talk about what has happened since the school sent out, made the post. You guys did the video. And what transpired after that? So we're going to take a break. We're going to come back and continue this story. Stay with us. It is our duty to fight for freedom. It is our duty to fight for freedom. We have nothing to lose but our chains. We have nothing to lose but our chains. 
I reached out and, and made a statement about the issue with Milwaukee Lutheran High School because I've heard from several constituents, students and alumni, uh, people of color that have said they've had issues with racism at this school at least for the last 50 years. So when you think about those things, that says that we have a pattern and we have a problem at this school. The history of racism in this school goes back decades. My mother can talk about it, my grandmother can talk about it, I can talk about it. And if we're gonna sit here and allow this school to continue to take public dollars to educate black students, we have to hold them accountable for all black lives. I think this is something that must be addressed. You can no longer couch this in religious dogma. This is not the teaching that Christ teaches. Um, when you don't hear everybody, that's a problem. And when you are forcibly dismissing their feelings and their experiences, that to me is a problem. That is why I released the statement and that is why I'm here with the people in my district today, making sure that we hold everybody accountable. That piece was from a protest shortly after Milwaukee Lutheran High School rendered that Facebook statement. Facebook post and the reaction from the alumni. Now, I want to talk to you guys about kind of the timeline. So we have Milwaukee Lutheran with a Facebook post. We have the video response from alumni about it that, hey, I experienced some racism. And then what happens next? Did we get the media response to the video right away? So, yeah, right after the video, um, tons of likes, tons of comments, tons of shares um, started to get some media traction. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe we went on WISN uh, um, and um, CBS, I think it was one more. Was it CBS, LaShondra? Help me out. I don't remember. Okay. Two of them. Two of them. Okay. <laughs> Two of them. All right. Um, so after that, um, I started getting contacted by uh, some teachers from Milwaukee Lutheran first. Um, they were not necessarily talking about meeting. They were um, kind of trying to get me to take the video down. Oh. Um, I, yeah, I started getting lots of messages from um, alumni mm -hmm. um, trying to be uh, this uh, excuse me mm -hmm. try to invalidate our experiences try to tell me it wasn't true we were just trying to spark up some stuff um some were threats we started getting like some legal threats people starting to say that that was borderline um defamation and just a lot of craziness started going on there and so um after that i began to reach out to the administrators um via email requesting for um, a meeting or some type of in-person or zoom some type of something and uh with traction <clears throat> excuse me with the traction that it was getting they accepted um we set a time uh for i believe it was the next monday so about a week out from when that was all happening right. and uh leading up to the meeting we had the protest on a sunday the day before the meeting and um so, yeah, that was kind of the immediate response. Now, tell me why, you know, you're having the meeting. Why the protest before the meeting? So the protest was actually organized by um, Angela Harris, who's a teacher at MPS. She's a teacher at MPS school, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, she organized it. And um, we just wanted to attend. You know, when we saw that it was um, saw it getting shared on Facebook with all that was transpiring, we thought this would be great. Um, I'm not sure if she planned it before or after the video was put out because we put the video out um, about 36 hours later after the post was made. So I'm not sure if she had already planned it, mm -hmm. but um, we just wanted to participate. Once we saw that that was going on, we thought that was great. So that's um, why we joined her in that effort at the protest. OK, so the next day you meet with the principal. After the protest, yes. And how did that go? Did the having the pro the protest, did that cause a little friction or or no? Well, the protest wasn't brought up. Um, so I wouldn't say it did. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I would say the protest, like I was uh, mentioning earlier, the um, the armed security guard and the yellow caution tape around the school kind of rubbed myself and everyone else who was at attendance at the protest kind of rubbed us a little wrong made um, us feel like the school looked at us as 
threats as someone who would not peacefully protest um, like we were some types of thugs or something as if we were going to harm property or damage things. And um, I thought that kind of rubbed us the wrong way, which led to me um, releasing the second video that um, I put out. But um, as far as the meeting, nothing was mentioned about the protest in the meeting. Okay. And do you think it was a productive meeting? Um, I'll let these guys answer. They were at the meeting also. Yeah, I wasn't at the protest because I wasn't in Wisconsin, but I was at the meeting. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a pretty productive meeting from what I was getting from it. Um, he was taking those, seemed to be attentive. Um, yeah, it just, it seemed like it was going well. Um, he said he would get back to us. <laughs> As you can see, they never got really back to us. They never really did anything we proposed at the meeting. Um, so I don't, I don't know what happened in behind the scenes with that, but it seemed like it was going somewhere. And then a couple of weeks went by and we're like, dang, what happened? Right. Right. So what happens after that? You meet with him. This is the principal that you met with, right? Correct. Okay. So then we go a little longer and you meet with the CEO. Yep. So that was, that was just myself. Um, that was an in-person meeting down at his office in West Dallas. Um, we had that meeting about a month later. So how did that go? Um, I would say productive in a way. Um, productive more so because we got the truth. Um, we got honesty from him. Um, he was a lot more transparent with what they were willing to do and not do. Whereas the first meeting with the principal, it was... Yeah, yeah, great. We're all, you know, we're speaking the same language. We're going to do all this stuff. And he was a lot more transparent. You know, we don't think we're going to do this. We don't think we're going to do that, but we can maybe try this. So that was, I would say, a little more productive. Um, the only thing with it is it didn't feel very genuine. Um, just from the feeling I got personally, a lot of in-house talk, a lot of wanting to fix things between the students and um, the teachers and just everybody who's at the school daily. Um, one of the biggest things that um, I noticed, he said that the statement they initially put out was reviewed. It was made by himself and 12 other faculty or his advisors, whomever they might've been. So it did get run past other people. And he said that he was meeting with those same people to fix it. And it's kind of like, well, <laughs> don't think that's quite the best thing to do but he wasn't budging he did not move off of that position um we you know I, I pulled tooth and nail we we tried to pressure him I I said you know get myself at the table get um Dr. Liston Dr. Malik, Monique Liston who's an alumni also who's actually a social injustice professor at Marquette she's literally a professional in these types of things you know get us involved get us at the table get more people of color that, you know, hear our voices. Mm -hmm. um, and, he, and they just would not budge. He seemed to be um, really stubborn and, and really rule with the iron fist, you know, it was kind of his way or, or, or nothing else. And I guess that's where I'm kind of like not optimistic that changes on the way soon, because it just didn't seem very genuine um, throughout that meeting. Okay. Here's a cold Ron. I was, uh, got this from, um, an article in the journal Sentinel where they talked to him and he said that the school had already begun addressing concerns of black students and faculty before the black lives matter controversy unfolded. He said he created a student advisory group that was supposed to hold its first meeting in March, but it was postponed because, because of the pandemic. And in June, he convened a listening session for employees of color and is developing plans to improve the curriculum that will be implemented when school resumes in person. And it's, he adds, every organization needs to get better related to systemic racism. Uh, and adding, he condemns the sin of racism in all of its manifestations. So, um, something possibly might be happening, but I, I guess you feel like you guys will never know because it's happening within and not including any outsiders. Yeah, right. that's yeah. one of the biggest disappointing things about this is at the meeting that we had with Milwaukee Lutheran's principal, 
we all had created a list of solutions with us, other alumni, different community members, current students at the school. And we all felt fairly confident that with the solutions presented, they wouldn't have any difficulties implementing the majority of them. None of them required any economic backpower at all, more or less. It's like, if we want to do this tomorrow, we can do this tomorrow. And to be hit with a message of, well, we're going to do all these things in-house and to not have that transparency with students, community members, and concerned alumni almost comes across as a slap in the face for all the efforts that we've all been doing. Because genuinely, if we're all on board on the same page of wanting Milwaukee Lutheran to be better, then we should be able to be in those spaces to help discuss well, how can we improve Milwaukee Lutheran? Don't try to stifle our voices. Okay. I want to show the uh, the second video that you did and we referred to earlier. Um, let's take a look at that. My name is Abby, and I witnessed and participated in racism at Milwaukee Lutheran High School. My name is Terry, and I have witnessed racism at Milwaukee Lutheran High School. My name is Jamie, and I have witnessed racism at Milwaukee Lutheran High School. My name is Sarah, and I have witnessed racism at Milwaukee Lutheran High School. My name is Rachel, and I've witnessed racism at Milwaukee Lutheran. My name is Allie, and I've witnessed racism at Milwaukee Lutheran. My name is Alexandria, and I have witnessed racism at Milwaukee Lutheran High School. My name is Flannery, and I have witnessed racism at Milwaukee Lutheran. My name is Josh, and I witnessed racism at Milwaukee Lutheran High School. My name is Giovanna, and I've witnessed racism at Milwaukee Lutheran. My name is Sophia, and I have witnessed racism in Milwaukee Lutheran High School. My name is Griffin, and I've witnessed racism at Milwaukee Lutheran. Hi, my name is Rebecca Johnson, and I've witnessed racism at Milwaukee Lutheran High School. My name is Kristen, and I've witnessed racism at Milwaukee Lutheran High School. Okay, that was uh, with students, white students, who were talking about seeing racism, which I thought was quite interesting. Was it hard to find these folks to talk on camera? Um, not one bit. Not one, not bit. one bit. I honestly reached out to just on Facebook Messenger, you know, obviously after because this came after the initial video. And um, so they had already saw the first one. Mm-hmm. And so the pitch was more or less, you know, help me, you know, help me fight this fight. You know, you were there. I know you saw it. You know, I know you have friends who went to high school with you, tell them. And, um, and from there, they just started to flow in. I probably asked 10 people on Facebook and they started to flow and got a good amount, sent them in and we got the video done. Uh, I think the, <clears throat> the harder part was the um, participated only one wanted to own up and admit to the participation part. Yeah, I and, saw um, that. I thought that was a little discouraging, mm-hmm. but um, lots of uh, power to her for you know making that stand and wanting to acknowledge that and uh, move on from that. She took a lot of um, just looking at the comments in the video. She took a lot of heat in that video, and um, I thought she handled it pretty well in the comments and um, being transparent about you know hey I know I made that mistake, but you know, I'm working on it, you know, and I'm fixing it. And I want it to have that public and, and let it be known, you know, that, that, that these guys are not just making up stuff. You know, this is a real thing within the school because not only have I seen it, I've done it. And so her doing that, um, I think really brought the videos together and really kind of shut up any naysayer because it's, you know, we said we experienced it. They said they witnessed it. And now she's also saying she participated. So, I mean, there's really nothing else you can do to say this is not a real issue. Let's address it and let's fix it together. Yep. It definitely made it stronger and kudos to her. Okay. We're about to end, but I want to ask you about these solutions. What are the solutions that you see that you would like to see? Follow our proposals. We have a lot. I mean, give me a synopsis. Give me, give, give me the shorter version. Um, ultimately, we just want to see love given and shown to people. And all of the solutions we came up with, love was at the center and core of all of them. Okay. 
Can give me some specifics. All right, yeah, I think to get um direct with them, uh, I have the list in front of me here. I know the the first solution we put on that um we were told was being worked on even prior to the meeting was um, another statement being put out, not necessarily apologizing or taking the statement back, but acknowledging that it was tone deaf, extremely tone deaf and poorly written and uh, make that clear and acknowledge it and outline your plan moving forward, you know, to mm-hmm. kind of reconciliate with the black community. And, and that was really, I think, hurtful to me that we were told that that statement was in the works and being worked on and would be out. And um, here we are six weeks later, and there's still no sign of it. And when I talked to Cole Braun, he just flat out told me, yeah, that's not going to come. And um, I thought that was really frustrating that, you know, because if we can't even do that, acknowledge it publicly, how are we supposed to be hopeful that, you know, change is on the way? If you're not even willing to go out on a limb and, 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 and let the public hold you accountable, you know? tell your alumni, tell your students, tell your parents, hey, we're going to fix this. And I think that's the core of why they didn't want to do it, because they don't want to be held accountable. They don't want people checking in and they because at the end of the day, they're not really planning on fixing anything. And I hate to say it like that, but but I mean, that's just honestly how it feels. Like Carl said earlier, this is not a new issue. You know, we we going through the comments of our video. We had alumni checking in 70s. 80s 90s this is great you know this has been an ongoing issue thank you for speaking up thank you for letting your voices be heard and and it's very frustrating because if not now then when you know when's going to be the appropriate time if not now when i talked to cole one of the things he said that excuse my language but it pissed me off he said we can't solve racism didn't ask you to do that. That was nowhere to be found on our list of solutions. But you are a juggernaut in the education industry. You oversee three large schools in the Milwaukee area. So you can get at the front of the situation and really start to make a change within your organizations because change is coming whether you like it or not, regardless. And so why not get in the front of this, be a leader and stand up and and, and start to make a difference, implement some of these things we talked about, these everything we asked for was 100% free. We asked you to promote HBCUs and hire Black institutions. You have Concordia and the Navy and the Army and and all these other schools come in. I did not know what an HBCU was until I graduated. Never heard of it. It wasn't until I, and I probably wouldn't have had I not had a track meet at one. I had a track meet at Norfolk State University and someone said, this is an HBCU. And I was like, what is that? no idea. And and that's frustrating that I don't even know what options I have out there. And that's standing for historically black college and universities. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And your school is now, like Karan said, the demographic is changing. It's changing. You're now 85 to 90 percent African-American, but your your, your teachers are still majority 80 percent white. And and, and that's 80 percent being generous is probably less than that. And, And the two primary um the the teachers that you actually have there are art teacher and a choir teacher and and, and it's you know what what, why are we only teaching the arts why can't we have a black math teacher a black english teacher you know some some something like that and and then you count your your security guards and your your um your sports um coaches as a part of your black faculty to try to make your numbers look better but 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 we see right through that you know The, the you know you're 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 trying but are you really trying? You know, it, it, it just seems like they keep feeding us the, the you know, what we want to hear to kind of shut us up for now so it can keep moving forward and they can keep doing what they're doing. And um, just to go back to the statement, you know, like they said, we was it two point four million dollars to the black community. You know, I, I, I saw the numbers. You get a lot more than that from these vouchers, you know, the, you, your choice program taking in these African-American students, you're making more than that 2.4 you're putting back in. And, and, and it's just so frustrating because it's like, we are now the, the, the prime, you know, we're the, we're the primary, like, like you're not getting tuition anymore. You know, if, yeah. if there's no black students there with no choice, the school's not open. And that's just to call it like it is. And so for you to continue to ignore us 
when we're the reason the school is open at this point is very frustrating. We want you to celebrate Black History Month, you know, something as simple as that. And you're refusing to do it. Well, I hope and, and, I hope yeah. that um, they are they will begin to listen because um, it goes beyond just the a CEO. There are other members, the board members and that. I hope that they're wi- there will come a time when they are willing to expand and allow others a seat at the table. Diversity, as you were you guys so well um, advocate. And hopefully with that, more perspectives can come out. And because sometimes when people feel like they're on the defensive and, you know, all these other emotions go into it and then there's there are different perspectives and, you know, different, um, you know, things with intention, you think I did it this way and I didn't do it because of that. You know, all those things we get caught up, which get us off target. Um, I'm hoping that maybe, you know, people, as they hear more of this, will realize, okay, yes, we need to welcome more people at our table to talk about this, to discuss it, and truly address it. Because, I mean, they've got, as you said, they've got a large African-American population within that school. So um, we'll see what happens. Uh, I commend you guys for taking a stand, trying to make a change. And I, I hope you don't stop talking. Keep it, keep it up. And I'm assuming that you won't, you won't, you will ha- you probably have other things planned, but at this point you cannot talk about it. Am I right? Yeah, we definitely have things planned. Um, I think it's just, uh, more making, um, what's kind of going on behind the scenes, bringing it to the front of the, you know, bringing it to the front. Uh, I, I, I think the days of Milwaukee Lutheran tricking African-American students and families that they're, they're saving us from this environment, you know, going to a private school and taking us from the MPS system. I think those days are, 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 are going to be short lived because, you know, I, I, I've, looked at the department of education i saw their report card stats their their test scores and 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 it's to the point where we're not even getting good schooling there you know the curriculum's not good it's bad you know i've seen the numbers they don't meet expectation in any academic category right now and so five ten twenty years ago it was okay for us to like I said, put our head down, go through school and get the education because at least it's a good private school education. So I'll deal with the hostile environment, yeah. but it's no longer the case anymore. Now it's hostile environment. I don't have teachers who look like me and I'm getting a below average curriculum. And um, when you hear those three things, it's like, well, why do you go there? Right. And so that's the point we're kind of at. Why are we sending our students there? Carl, Karan, you guys both graduated from Madison. When you got there, did you feel well prepped from Milwaukee Lutheran's curriculum? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that. No, not at all. No, I wouldn't say I felt adequately prepared for a higher education. And there it is. And so this is what we're trying to, you know, we're we're trying to fight a lot at once here, you know, and, and um, so like you said, we got a lot more coming, but um, we know it's going to be a slow grind. It's going to be a long fight. If somebody from Milwaukee Lutheran said, OK, come alongside us. Come. Let's talk. Let's work on this. You know, not this is what you do, but really talk and work on this. Would you guys be willing? Me personally, I would not because I'm not professional. I think this is something that goes beyond over my head. You know, I'm just a, a passionate alumni who wants to see his his alma mater do better, you know. But I think, you know, this is something that they could seek professional help from. Like Dr. Liston, who is a professional in this, she has a nonprofit that would be more than happy that, you know, to 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 help but they they cut her out they block her from their facebook page you know they 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 they're seeking help they're they're trying to solve everything within themselves but they just don't have the answers you're not gonna get it done that way okay 
Well, a lot of people will be watching because you guys have made us all aware. And, uh, we'll, and they said they will fix it and work on this within uh, their school. And I'm sure the people within the school will be talking. So there's more to come. To be continued, I guess I want to say. So we will see. Listen, I want to thank you, Carl Greer, Karad Sims, uh, Monty Berry. You guys, thank you for coming and telling me and explaining what all happened and where you go from here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. And thank you for joining us for another edition of the 411 Live Real People, Real Talk. Our past episodes you can find on your favorite podcast platform. Just search the 411 Live. We are a nonprofit organization, so if you would like to help us, please go to our website, the411live.org. Until next time, I'm Beverly Taylor, and this is the 411 Live. Real people, real talk. If you would like to check out past episodes, there are many ways. Go to your favorite podcast platform. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Like and watch us on Facebook. Watch and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you have suggestions for future episodes, go to our website, the411live.org.